this morning, uh, I forgot my guitar at the house. I'd taken it this weekend to the house to do some work on it. And so, ah, boy, there's, there's another reason to get a second guitar, right? One to have at the house and one to have at the church. I think I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. So we have no song this morning, but we'll just go right into John chapter 8. Uh, we're going to pick up in the 31st verse and just go through verse 38 this morning. I'd love to continue on in the chapter, but it's just too much to, to try to absorb in one morning. And let me, let me tell you this again. I've probably said this before. A lot of times we think we have to read a number of chapters a day of Scripture, but I find it best just to um, meditate on what we can uh, meditate on for that morning or that day. Uh, I, I've learned a long time ago, man, God can speak in five seconds uh, more than what we could ever plod and try to hear from him in five hours. And so God uh, God can speak to us in a short passage as well. And he does in this chapter. Remember, Jesus is there at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's, it's winding down and he's continuing to teach there uh, on the temple grounds. And there were those that opposed him and questioned him, etc. But But in verse 31, Jesus begins to speak. And John tells us he speaks to those that have believed. And so evidently there were some there in the crowd who at least made an initial um, step towards believing uh, that Christ was Messiah. It doesn't necessarily mean that they had come to fully embrace him as Lord and Savior, but at least they began to believe. And so Jesus is speaking to them, those that believe. And he's telling them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I want us to notice that there, there's a condition there. He says, if you abide in my words, um, meaning that, that there's a difference in, in just simply having a cognitive belief in Jesus and, and becoming one of his disciples, to abide in his word. That word abide means to, uh, to dwell, uh, to be joined to. And so he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. There's an indication here, too, of what we call the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, that those who are truly believers, those who have truly trusted Christ, they will abide to the very end. And it, it, we, we've all seen Christians or so-called followers of Christ who have made an initial step and they may even profess that they trust Christ or believe Christ, but if you will, the real proof in the pudding is if they abide unto the end. I say it often, I, I love to see somebody come to Christ, accept Jesus, uh, but a real concern is where we see them in five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or at the end of their life. And so it it is not a, a one-time event to trust Christ, but it is a is a transforming event that takes place in our lives, and it transforms as such that we abide with Him to the very end. Uh, that's the real test and proof whether or not someone has truly accepted Christ. I was just thinking in the last year, uh, there are a few individuals here, even the, in the body, who have made a, a a profession to Christ. Now I'm not judging whether or not they've truly been saved, but it's disheartening to see them. Uh, now a year later, not walking with the Lord, not abiding in his word. And so that's why discipleship is so important. It's why uh, Jesus has has commanded us to go and make disciples. Uh, a, a disciple doesn't make themselves. It, it requires the work of the Holy Spirit and the engagement of the body of Christ in that person's life. That's why I believe the, the, the greatest means to making disciples is one-on-one -on -one relational discipleship, where we who profess to be mature believers, we invest ourselves in that other individual. Um, I, I really think the mark of a true disciple is one who, or a mature disciple, is one who is discipling another. And so pray, if you're not engaged in personal discipleship, begin to ask the Lord, God, bring somebody in my life that I can make an investment in their life to help them grow, to mature in their faith, and become a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. It's so, so very important. 
he didn't tell us to go and make converts. There is that that beginning stage where somebody comes to Christ, but he commanded us to go and make disciples. It takes an intentional effort on our part to pour into somebody else's life and make a disciple. So he says, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Remember, Jesus said that he is the way, he is the truth. Uh, truth is not a philosophical concept, but truth is a person, and the person of truth is God. Jesus claimed to be the truth. So truth is contained in the nature and character of God. We, we hold that the Bible is absolute truth, meaning that it doesn't waver with events. It doesn't change with whatever a woke culture says truth is. Truth is God. It is the Word of God. And we can never compromise what the Word of God teaches because the Word of God emulates from who God himself is. And so no matter what the culture is saying, no matter what the current fads might be, truth is truth. And we can never waver from it. It's sad to watch as the church, the body of Christ in America, is getting influenced and bombarded by those who we use the term the woke culture, those who are pushing the LGBTQ agenda and all of these other things. Listen, I don't care what culture says, it is not truth. God's word is the only thing that is truth and that is what we have to hold to and that's what we lovingly have to proclaim. That's why yesterday, as I taught on hell, the woke culture and progressive Christianity does not want to accept, does not want to embrace, does not want to hold to the doctrine of hell. But we cannot escape it. I don't care what somebody thinks, that thought does not supersede the word of God. And so Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, it bids the question then, just as these hearers were going to ask, free from what? Are, are we enslaved? We're not enslaved in that physical sense, but Jesus was not speaking of physical slavery. Because they answered to him and they responded, we are the offspring of Abraham. Abraham, the father of the Jews. He says, they say, we are the offspring of Abraham and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free. Now, I find it kind of remarkable here that they made the statement that they had never been enslaved to anyone. Did, did they forget their slavery in Egypt? Uh, did they forget the Assyrians who invaded the north and, and bound them? Did they forget the Babylonians who came in and conquered the southern kingdom and took them into slavery for 70 years in Babylon? Did they forget or did they have as an oversight their, in, in, uh, their enslavement to the Romans at this time. Um, perhaps they were being arrogant. Uh, perhaps they were, they were thinking, but, but we are, while we may have been in bondage in our hearts, we were never slaves. Whatever it was, it seems to be an oversight that they would make that claim. They were blinded, really, to their own enslavement. And isn't that true that that we can be enslaved to something or someone and be blinded to the fact that we are in slavery to that other one. But what Jesus was speaking of here was not a physical enslavement. He was speaking of being enslaved to sin because he answers them in verse 34. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And every human being practices sin. We are enslaved to sin before we come to know Christ. And after that point, we are set free from the bondage and slavery and the penalty of sin. Thank him for that this morning. He says in verse 35, The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. Um, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, this is a little tricky phrase. The slave does not remain in the household, not physically the household, but in the family of the master who enslaves them. 
but the Son remains there forever. And if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And so what Jesus is speaking of is as, as we are in him, he is the Son, and he remains forever in the household of God. And so if we are in him, then we will always remain forever in the household. It's a glorious reality that once we have been truly born again, we have been adopted as the children of God, we have been brought into the family of God, and nothing can ever undo that adoption that is taking place. Once we have been set free from slavery to sin and the master of that, who is the devil himself, then we have been brought into God's household and we remain there forever in Christ. And so that's what he's teaching here. Uh, verse 37, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen from my father, from my father, and do what you have heard from your father. He's beginning to make a contrast. He is of his father, the heavenly father. They are of their father, the enemy, Satan, the devil. And we too once were, if if we've been born again, we were once fathered, if you will, by the devil. He's going to go on further, beginning in verse 39, to expound on that, which we'll look at tomorrow. But I want to remind us of what Paul spoke to us in Romans chapter 6. Paul speaks of this, uh, where we were once bound to slavery and sin, but now that we have trusted Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. Uh, picking up in verse 5 of chapter 6 of Romans, and you can go and look at this a little bit later in the day. He says this, For if we have been united with him, that is Christ, in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 6, We know that our old self, that is our old nature, was crucified, our sin nature, it was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now, this does not mean that we no longer sin. My goodness, we all sin in so many different ways every day, many ways that we're not even conscious of. Um, but we are no longer enslaved to sin. We have been set free. It no longer has reign and rule over our lives or our eternity. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. That is, one who has died to themselves, died with Christ, we were buried with Christ and raised with Christ to a new life. So that old nature was crucified with Christ. It is dead. It no longer has power to, to uh, dominate us. We do not have to be dominated by that old nature. Oh, our flesh, influenced by our old nature, leads us to temptation and sin every single day, and we fall to it. But thank God for the blood of Jesus who has set us free from slavery to sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, verse 8, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. We have died to sin. When Christ went to the cross and our sins were laid on him, and he suffered the wrath of God on the cross on, on account of our sins in our place, he was buried and he was raised again to new life. And the Bible says that when Christ died, we also died at that point where we appropriated that by placing our trust in Christ. Thank God this morning that you have died with Christ, you've been buried with him, you've been raised to new life, and you now live in him, and that you have been set free from slavery and bondage of sin to live freedom in Christ. 
man, what a blessed hope it is. It never gets old, and it should never get old to us. That's why we need to be in the Word every single day to be reminded of those things that Christ has done on our behalf. Well, I pray that God gives you and me an opportunity today to sow a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart in their life. And if a seed has already been sown, that we have the wisdom and the love and the graces and the mercies and the truth to be able to cultivate that seed. And if God, by his grace, would allow us to watch him save somebody today, boy, that'd just make a glorious day. Well, I pray the Lord's blessings on you. I pray that he would keep you. I look forward to being with you tomorrow morning, and I'll have my guitar tomorrow morning. I love you. Have a great day.